So with that introduction, um, uh, I'd like to uh, start the symposium by introducing Professor uh, Yan Rabai, our first speaker. Um, so, so we are honored to have uh, Professor Yan Rabai, and um, we actually hosted Yan a couple of times for, for both SSCS Society and also Computer Society. Uh, he's been uh, very generous and kind to us to accept our invitations. And uh, um, we'd like to welcome him. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Rabai. Uh, Yan holds uh, the Donald O. Pedersen Distinguished Professorship at UC Berkeley. And uh, he's also the founding director of uh, Berkeley Wireless Research Center, BWRC, and Berkeley Ubiquitous Swarm Lab. And also he served as Electrical Engineering Division Chair uh, at uh, UC Berkeley twice in the past. Uh, Professor Rabai has made uh, high impact contributions. As you all know, the, his textbook and his works, if you're in ASIC design and digital design, um, and also in, in a lot of other areas like wireless systems, low power integrated circuits, sensor networks, and ubiquitous computing. Uh, his current interest, the new focus of his research, is on the conception of the next generation distributed systems, as well as the exploration of the interaction between um, cyber and biological world. I mean, he does a lot of IoT stuff, um, as well as uh, high, high efficiency computing in his research. Uh, he's a recipient of major awards, uh, including um, uh, Design Automation Conference Award, a Lifetime Achievement Award, and uh, Semiconductor Industry Association Award, among uh, uh, many uh, other awards, uh, and also a, an honorary doctorate from Lund University in Sweden. He is an IEEE fellow, and uh, he's been involved with uh, a variety of startups in technology, uh, specifically the recent one, Cortera Nanotechnologies, uh, which he co-founded um, a couple of years ago. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to invite Yan for, for his talk. Please go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have you all here in this rainy day in the Bay Area. So, um, as you will see, my, the title of my talk is kind of mysterious. It's called it, uh, Adventures in High Dimensions. And I'll, uh, I think while I walk to the presentation, I think things will become clearer. But let me first kind of set the tone a little bit of where I'm leading, uh, why, this, uh, uh, why I'm basically interested in this particular space. And let's see if I can make this work. Wireless technology. We should be able to handle that. There you go. So it is time, I really believe that we are at a juncture, a juncture in how computing and information technology will evolve and change. So it's time to rethink. And there's a couple of reasons why we need to rethink how we do computing. First of all, the nature of computing itself is changing. Computing used to be algorithmic centric. You basically execute algorithms as fast as possible and as accurately as possible. That's changed. As already mentioned, data is now the new resource. And computing has become more and more data centric. From an, we also are moving from an algorithm based approach to something that's based on learning. We take the data and we interpret the data and that's driving how we do the computation. By nature, these things are massively parallel. Concurrency is everywhere. Something that used to be a hard thing to get is really present. And computing is everywhere. The world is becoming our computer. It's every component is directly ingrained in our daily life through basically the combination of cloud computing with mobiles and access points and things like that. And then ultimately all those IoT devices that have some intelligence and are networked. So computation is changing. The second thing is that the platform underneath is changing is under challenge as well. Actually, some of the approaches we've been using for a long period of time are losing their oomph. They don't really are as powerful anymore as they used to be. And there's two main reasons that I can basically highlight why pro building processors as we used to do is getting harder and harder. First of all, it is the interconnect issue. It's not just about anymore about the computing element, 
but inter interconnect itself on chip and between chips is becoming a dominant factor. And so is the memory wall. We basically have separated, our approach to computing has separated storage and computing. And that separation is coming back to haunt us right now. Really, this limits what we can do and basically provide a limiting factor on where we can drive efficiency of computing. The third factor that uh, I want to bring up, why it's time to rethink computing, is that the platform of ALT is again losing its oomph. The devices don't scale anymore as we used to be, and especially in the energy space. Energy per operation is still going down. Even if we're going down to seven nanometer technologies, we still see that we get this little bit of gain, but it's getting smaller and smaller. And the main reason for that, we're stuck with the voltages. We're stuck because of the fact that we have variability. All those type of things limit how far we can drive down the energy per operation. Uh, we are stuck because we are married to a deterministic computational paradigm that basically requires that answers or computation has to be always correct. So, at the same time, I think there's amazing opportunities out there. Um, our device folks and technology folks have not stood still. There's a variety of very interesting new devices coming out, especially in the memory space, but also at your logic level. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit later down the road in this presentation. And the other factor is that this whole idea of back-end processing, that we actually can layer multiple devices on top of each other into a densely 3D stack, is opening the door for revisiting what a computing element could look like. So 3D integration as a great opportunity. But the problem is, again, it doesn't work with our traditional computational paradigms. Yield, variability, low SNR, basically are going to haunt us. And if you want to build a computational element that's dense, uses trillions of devices in one dense volume, we need to rethink computing. Now, what are the opportunities in terms of computational models? We've been so long used to the Turing-based type or the von Neumann-style computing models. Where can we look for other opportunities? And the answer is, look at nature. Nature has also been doing computing for a long period of time. Biological elements are basically computing elements. And the most important one is the thing we carry with us all the time. It is our organic computer that sits in our head. It is an amazing engine. It is a very powerful computer. And it's efficient. Actually, it consumes about 20 watts of power on average, depending on how much activity we do. If you do the math on this, you do the analysis, how much computation do I perform, how much power do I consume, all those type of things, you can come up with an estimate of the computational efficiency of your brain. And the numbers you typically end up is about two to three orders of magnitude better than what silicon today can do. So there's an opportunity there. At the same time, the brain doesn't use the smallest feature, the highest speeds, or anything like that. Actually, the devices that are in here, in my head, are kind of iffy devices. They're highly variable. They are prone to failure. While I'm giving this presentation, I'm going to lose a, probably a couple hundred thousand neurons, and I'm still not crashing, So, which is quite amazing. You maintain reliability in the presence of a computational platform that's changing and prone to errors. At the same time, also using those mediocre components, we can get extremely high accuracy in certain functions like auditory systems, olfactory systems, basically inter interpreting a mass amount of data that comes into our eyes, ears, and senses, and we try to make sense on it, analyze it, and ultimately act on it. So it is worthwhile to understand a little bit or maybe get inspired by this device and use that as a way for us to, to rethink the way we may build computing devices. The problem is we don't understand the brain yet. We learn a lot. In the last decades or so, there has been an enormous amount of progress, but it's 
no way today that we can start cloning the functionality of the brain. Singularity is not here yet, I can tell you that. So, interesting to put the two visions of computing together. Right? If you take your traditional phenomenon processor, we valued computing as the key element. The key component was the processor, the data path, where we tried to feed as much data through as possible, and then we built around this a whole sea of hierarchies to make sure that we can get the rate, keep that processor as busy as possible. So that's one mindset. On the other hand, the brain is very different. Um, actually, I'm not sure, uh, there's a little video clip in here that shows, but I don't think I, if you could click on that, would that be possible? Just click on that brain thing, good. It shows how the brain basically operates when you perform certain functions. I basically ask you a question, you think about the question, and you answer the question. And what you see here is various regions of the brain firing up. First of all, you have the auditory cortex, the auditory system coming in. Uh, you basically take sense of the data, you start interpreting the world, you go to higher levels of semantics, you go to decision making, which is your prefrontal cortex, and then ultimately you go to motor control, which is speaking. Very spatially distributed, as you can see, also very sparse from a computational perspective. So very different models, keeping it as busy as possible while I'm firing up a piece of computing when I need it. Very different mindsets. Now, fortunately, they're not that far apart any longer. What we've seen is over the times we've been some, seeing some convergence. We've gone away from the single processor to multiprocessor to many processors on a die. And at the same time, we've seen actually that memory has to start migrate towards the processors. The idea of in-memory processing is starting to happen, similar to what we see in the brain. They actually start getting closer to each other. The idea that I actually can leave a processor dark, not dark silicon, a dark processor, start to emerge. You only turn on the processor when you need the function that's supported by that processor. Just like our brain does, we fire the piece of the brain when we need the data that's stored there. Okay? So they're actually converging towards each other, which I think is a good thing to think about. Now, when you talk Start talking about the brain, people talk about the brain, there's no such thing as the brain. There's many different regions, and very different regions have various styles of neurons. There's not a single neuron. Neurons come in different flavors. Basic function is the same, but they have different connectivity models, and so on and so forth. There's another thing is that the brain has two distinct components. There's what we call the gray matter, where computation is happening and memory is. Um, overall, about 85 billion neurons in a typical human, and about three orders of magnitude more connection points, to synapses. So, think about this. In terms of complexity, integrated circuits are starting to approach this. We're starting to have tens of billions of transistors on the die. We don't not, we're not there yet in terms of any connect points, but we're going to close slowly but surely into that same point. The other interesting thing to observe is that the other big part of your brain is wiring, interconnect. There's this big thing which is called the white matter, which are a bunch of cables of wires that connect the different regions together. Now it's interesting to observe that independent of what animal you're looking at, you look at a little rat or a little mouse, or you go to a whale, the ratio of white versus gray mass is approximately constant, and it's about 1.3 times more wiring than there is gray mass computing elements. Now that sounds like a large element, but think about your chips of today. We have 15 layers of metal interconnect, huge thing, and then all your transistors are in a very thin layer. Actually, the volumetric ratios is even very much more pronounced in, 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 in uh, traditional silicon of today. So the other part is that if you now go to the gray mass, even there you see various this very different components. Um, think about the peripheral neural network. The eyes, the nose, your skin, all this type of thing that take data in. Huge number of sensors. Very lousy sensors. They're not very good. But you have lots of them, and they overlap. Huge amount of data, highly redundant, 
And the first thing we do before we even go to the cortex is you compress it. You throw, you take all that data together and you compress it because we have a band limited channel, for instance, between the eye and our visual cortex. Actually, the amount of data I can send to is about 10 to 100 megabits per second. That's the band limitation of your optical nerve. Then you look at various parts of the brain and you see very different structures and how neurons are connected. Um, if you go to the cerebellar cortex, which is not as well known as the cortex, the cerebellum, but actually contains half of the neurons in your head. Um, actually, you look at that structure as a circuit designer and you will recognize what it is. It looks like a memory and it is a memory. You have a decoder, it's actually a random decoder. We have word lines, which are called the uh, parallel fibers. There is actually memory cells, the granular cells or, or the pecunia cells, and then ultimately output fibers, which are basically your bit lines. This thing is a large search engine, it's an associative memory. And then finally you have the cortex, which is the latest part that got added to the structure, where actually a lot of the intelligence is basically st stored. It's a large network of dense interconnected neural networks organized in a very interesting structure, which are columns. So if we talk about brain inspired, you have to basically talk about what area we're basically targeting at. And they're not all the same, okay? So neural nets, as we talk about, typically are modeled after the cortex, okay? So the important thing though is Trying to mimic this into silicon is a really bad idea, or whatever technology you're using. It's a bad idea. They have different properties. But at least it's worthwhile to look at the brain and to say what are some of the defining properties that basically determine or basically are defining some of the computational paradigms in the brain, at least the ones we understand. Number one, it's learning based. There's some pre-programming in advance. There's some uh, fixed things that are already there, but most of it is basically learned. It is approximate, it is statistical. There's no ones and zeros in your brain. So it's mostly analog or somewhere discrete occasionally, but definitely not high precision digital. Information actually is represented in many different ways. It can be represented as a pattern. It can be represented as a set of phase relations between various neurons. It can be represented as distributions. Very statistical though. And actually, it turns out that randomness is an essence in the computational paradigm. Random is good. It actually helps us to provide the robustness. As already pointed out, function where there's no time multiplexing in the brain, it's not like we have one central processor where we do all our tasks. It is spatially mapped. For every function, typically there's an amount of computing provided. Memory and logic are totally intertwined. They're sitting together. They're very closely interconnected to each other. It's also embarrassingly parallel, and it is sparse. The computation typically is sparse. As I showed you in that little video, you saw that the computation, we only fire up certain components at a time. Okay, so there are some good properties to think about and say, hey, can we learn something from that? Can we basically map that to our computational engines we want to build and solve problems? Now, Here's an important observation, I think, is really crucial. Um, trying to reverse engineer the brain without an adequate theory of computing is next to impossible. There's a beautiful paper you should read, it was in PLOS in January of this year, for, written by a neuroscientist. Neuroscientist says, if I would use the techniques that a neuroscientist uses today to understand the brain, could I understand how a microprocessor works? Basically, take the idea, you have a bunch of you have a, a layout or a chip, you take it apart, you get the netlist extracted, which is connectomics, and you basically try from there on to say, what's happening in that thing? And if you use the techniques that neuroscientists are using right now to reconstruct the brain, you won't get anywhere. Uh, it's looked like a bunch of noise. So you have to have a theory, and you can check the theories, but it's really important then. And the important elements of the theory have to address the following thing. How fast can you learn? Is it learning one time and then you store it? Or is it something that I do online? When I basically see things, do I adjust and uh, basically extend my learning? 
Retention over a lifetime. How long do I remember that learning? Humans are also very good in what we call generalization from examples. You learn an example and you extract and abstract from that. We also do a lot of reasoning by analogy. Say so this, I understand, is because it looks like that particular problem. Like, that's an interesting thing to think about as well. And obviously, we have to have tolerance for variability, noise, failure, and so on and so forth. So that's the learning theory we need to think about. And the challenge today is we have a lot of learning-based techniques we have out there, and we're building hardware for, but actually we don't really have the theory. We don't understand 100% why and how they work. So there's a lot of work to be done in that space. OK, so let's go a little bit after learning-based approaches. There's many different ways of looking at learning. You have the more statistician, statisticians approach, which is the Bayesian machine learning, belief propagation, reinforcement learning, graphical models, and all these kind of things. Um, very solid, really delivers you excellent results if you have a good model. The model is essential. And that's actually building the model itself, however, is non-trivial. Today, we execute those things on standard processors. If you basically do Bayesian type of learning, most of it is on standard processors. I think there's a lot of room to think about processors that basically run graphs of this nature very effectively and basically use the nature, the fact that all the numbers we're propagating are statistical numbers, they're approximations, and so on and so forth. If you realize that, we might come up with interesting architectures. We have the support vector machine approaches. This is that class of things which are basically classifications or classifiers. Again, these are very interesting, solve a set of problems. Um, however, they don't scale very well for very complex things. If you have a couple of parameters, they work real well, but you have some challenges. And then we have the deep nets or the neural nets in various flavor, convolutional, and so on and so forth. Um, there are basically learning-based approaches, but learning is separate from inference. Uh, we do learning in one step, using a gradient descent or something like that, and then the inference is where we execute the learned engine. So they're different from each other. The second thing is to do this well, as we have learned over the last couple of years compared to what we learned over the last 30 years, it is, it's better if you have a lot of data and if I have complex machines, if I can have multiple layers and lots of neurons in a single layer. So complexity is a part of the game, okay? So that's where they shine, and if you have that property, you're gonna be able to build excellent engines that people have demonstrated uh, profusely over the last couple of years. Now, the problem I have is the following one. I think it's great to have this massive intelligence sitting in blue things and so on and so forth, big machines, that can run those large neural networks, do that learning effect, learn basically work with the big data. However, the class of problems I'm interested in, which is that computing in the world, it's everywhere computing, basically having agents that are basically talking to people, drive little robots or drones that are around, help us to augment ourselves as humans, we need to bring that intelligence a lot closer to the human. There has to be a closed loop, low latency environment. And so, trying to figure out how can I scale those approaches from this very large complex engines to something that's portable that I can put in my pocket or potentially implant is really something to consider. And that's kind of driving a lot of the things I'm thinking about these days. So, interesting also to observe from a platform perspective what various computational type of approaches need. Think about deep nets. What are the key things you implement those things or any neural network? It's all about matrix multiply. Matrix multiply is the key thing. That's why, for instance, the Google TPU has a complete systolic array of multipliers, basically piping data to those multipliers as fast as it can. And it costs you some power, right? That is basically this engine is about, it's hugely performant, but it takes 150 watt. And then you see a whole slew of different approaches where people try to figure out how to basically get some more efficiency by either saying, well, I can give up on accuracy, I can prune the weights, I can basically, instead of having 32 bits, can I get away with four bits or one bit in my machine? 
They're also going to go to even more concurrency, utilization of some of the sparsity in those matrices and so on and so forth, or focus, for instance, on inference only, no learning. And I just uh, some examples that I show here, various nature. You have the A11 has this neural processor for basically facial recognition. It's a very, basically very much oriented towards inference. You have the IBM TrueNorth really pushing at concurrency. How many neurons can I implement on a particular device? Going to convolutional neural nets engines or processors that are built specially for that. And you can start seeing the power numbers going down from watts to milliwatts and so on and so forth. And ultimately the extreme is the people, the neuromorphic folks, that are trying to implement this whole thing in an analog thing. It says, actually, I don't really care if it's a bit or not, I can basically represent my data as analog numbers. But the key thing there is matrix multiply. Now the platforms we're basically developing, the hardware we're developing can solve some other problems. There's a class of people that look at oscillators as the key computational element. Again, this is inspired by things like the retina, where some of the neurons basically behave as coupled neural network or coupled oscillator networks. So the interesting thing is they solve a very different problem. In that case, for instance, you can solve a dynamic optimization problem, like simulated annealing. You have a problem, and I want to find out, like a graph problem, uh, for instance, travel sa traveling salesman, gr graph segmentation, strongly connected components, NPR problems, by putting this into a network of oscillators, initialize it, and let it dampen itself out. Um, and there's an example shown here how you can do image segmentation by just these groups of coupled oscillators. Now, with those nano devices I'll talk about in a minute, oscillators are actually an easy thing to build. We can make them very small, we can make it very efficient, this could lead to another class of computational engines. Actually, another option, what something I could do with coupled oscillators is implement an analog associative memory. An associative memory is a memory that basically stores a pattern, and when you put an input in there, it will return to you the closest pattern that was stored. So it's a search engine in the memory. That's what an associative memory is all about. Again, you can have actually an array of oscillators, you pre-program it with certain patterns that you want to recognize, and then you apply an unknown pattern, what will happen is that oscillator array will basically migrate to one of the known patterns. And again, you can build this by groups of nano oscillators together. So you can see that from a hardware perspective, there's some other computational models that arise by ob observing the capabilities of those devices. And the question is now, can I bring the top down and the bottom up together? What I'm going to do in the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on explicitly this uh, associative memory component. Uh, because I believe it's a very powerful component that can help us to tackle some problems very effectively, very efficiently. And this is where I'm ending up in my adventures in high dimensions. Um, I've been playing around with um, something that's called high dimensional computing for about the last six years or something like that. And it was a result of my interactions with a lot of computational neuroscientists uh, that said, hey, there's some interesting ideas here. As I already mentioned before, the brain doesn't work on numbers. The brain operates on patterns. The patterns formed by networks of neurons. That's basically storing a particular pattern by having a set of weights in there. Now, in, uh, as I will basically discuss, the patterns I'm dealing with will be represented as vectors, random vectors very highly random vectors with large dimensions. That's the basic computational elements I'm going to use. I'm going to use patterns as things to compute. As it's true with most patterns, you don't have to be accurate. As long as you're somewhere in the neighborhood, you're going to be fine. So it's approximate. And the interesting thing is there's some very beautiful mathematical properties connected to it. So I can reason about it. I can start building a theory of computing which is really important as well. And the key element of this, as I said, is the associative memory. It's a search engine that allows me to store patterns, and then when I create another pattern, I can figure out, is there already something in my memory that resembles what I just derived? So it's by analogy, just as, for instance, the brain very often works. Now, uh, as I said, the key element here is that the patterns, the vectors I'm going to use, are going to be high dimensional. And I'll explain that in a second. 
that's really the key hardware element I'm going to be driving at while we're going further. So why high dimensional vectors? Right. So suppose now that I take two n bit vectors. Um, and uh, let's say vectors of zeros and one. It doesn't really matter, it could be anything, but let's say a vector of zeros and one. And I make it uh, very large. Let's say I make it 10,000 bits. So I take one vector, randomly chosen, I take another vector, randomly chosen. What's the probability that they're gonna be half of the bits apart? It's really high, it's 99.99% .99 or something like that. Every time I basically take two things, elements or edit, you will see you have a zero and one, it's a 50% chance, you keep on doing, it's a binomial distribution. And the larger the dimension, the narrower the distribution comes. So what I ended up is basically creating things that are orthogonal, or pseudo-orthogonal. I cannot guarantee they're orthogonal, but I create a vector space with axes that are pseudo-orthogonal, which is a great element to start with. And the main reason we do this is because we're extremely in a sparse space. You have this 10,000 dimensions, it's like the galaxy. You have clusters in there, but those clusters are very far apart. There's never any confusion, am I part of this galaxy or this galaxy? It's very clear, right? Same thing here. So we start with that, and now we're gonna start computing with those elements. We're gonna combine them, we're gonna basically do things, and ultimately we're gonna look at correspondence analogy. So, Actually, our algebra is, looks like any other algebra. We have a number of elements. We have addition and multiplication. Addition is something that you use to basically present sets. I have two vectors in that high dimensional space. I add them together, I get a vector that has properties of both of the original vectors. It maintains some of the properties. So it's uh, similar to the original vectors we have. It's like bundling. Multiplication on the other hand is good for binding. You get, a, you multiply two vectors together, and by the way, multiplication on one bit things is XOR, very simple. Uh, addition is a majority gate, so that's fairly easy to do as well. So multiplication is you take two vectors and multiply them together, you get a new vector which are toggle, but it binds the two things together. It's like a key value pair. You have a key, you have a value, you multiply them together, you have a new, new entity that presents those. And since those things are inversible, I can extract the data again. And then finally we have permutation, which basically scrambles the vectors, uh, just basically changes the indexes a bit, and you get something that's orthogonal again. We're gonna use that to in encode sequencing. So this might sound very uh, abstract, and the question is what do we do? But it will be clear in a second what I'm doing with this. But remember, every single operator here is single bit oriented. They're basically bit to bit, local. Um, and uh, I also want to point out that the multiplication and the permutation are invertible, which is really important. Now, suppose I want to solve a problem. I'm going to take a problem which is language recognition. I give you a piece of text and I feed it in and say, what language is it? Right? Uh, French, English, whatever. So the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to start taking some examples. I have a language, a couple of examples of every single language I want to learn. And I'm going to start encoding this. I'm going to Say, okay, typical languages can be represented by 26 characters. Indo-European languages are all basically alphabet of 26. So I'm gonna say, okay, for every character, I pick a random vector of 10,000 bit long, and that, that's A, that's B, that's C, that's D. And now I'm gonna walk to my text. I have the word eat, and I'm gonna take the vector for A, E, the vector for A and T. I'm gonna shift them, I'm gonna encode the sequence by shifting, and then I multiply them all together. Uh, so I basically now create a trigram. I have three characters, I get a trigram, a pattern of a certain locality, and I then shift that pattern to my whole text. I add them all together, I create a set of those patterns. At the end, I have one vector, 10,000 bit long, and I say, that's French. And that vector is English, and so on and so forth. And then to recognize something new, I just feed them to the same encoder and figure out what vector is the closest. So pure vector arithmetic. So again, here's an example, 21 languages, I do 1,000 sandwiches per language to train the thing, letters only, you feed it to an encoder and you feed it into your associative memory. So you have as many entries in your associative memory as you have languages. And then the inference, 
Basically, it's very straightforward. You take, do the same encoding, you go to the associative memory, and you find the best language. The beauty of it is this works really well. It works for language identification, text categorization, and things like that. You don't have to do anything specific about it. It's all about these arithmetic elements. I have a computer now that does multiply, add, shift, and associative memory. Okay? So, what are the properties? The beautiful thing about this is that learning is extremely quick. It is online learning and it's one-shot learning. I basically go, you feed something in there that you have never seen before, you encode it, you put it in memory. It supports reasoning. Because now I have an algebra, I can ask questions on why I got a particular result. Again, it's very parallel. You have this 10,000 bits right there, and it's very memory-centric. Actually, it's in-memory computing. It's very robust against failure mechanism. Why? Because remember, these 10,000 bit vectors, the pseudo toggle, if I flip 3,000 bits, it's still extremely clear what vector I'm talking about. You have to flip half of the bits almost to make sure you create confusion. And it's ultra low energy because it's all local, in memory computing, there's no global computation or nothing at all. And I can implement this in these beautiful new technologies that are basically emerging. So, here's an example of something I've built. Um, very different application. This is now a gesture recognition system, let's say for a prosthetic device. I put a bunch of electrodes on your arm, measuring electrical voltages, and I would like just from those electrical signals figure out what gesture you made, or what gesture you're thinking about, if this would be a prosthetic device. Uh, you can see an example here, an electrode array that was built, 120, in this case about, it's about 100 channels that we basically put, put on the arm, so it's redundancy, like we normally do in any human sensory system. You over-dimension it, you put a lot more sensors in such a way that some of them are noise, but that's okay. And then I feed this to my encoder. In this case, you look first and say, okay, here's a particular channel. I'm going to say this data is from channel one. I might do some filtering in advance and some artifact removal and so on, but ultimately I do a key value pair. It says channel one, this value at this time slot. Channel two, channel three, channel four. All of them represent as 10,000 bit vectors. I add them all together, I have a time slice. All the information for all the sensors in one vector combined. And then I do the trigram or n-gram thing again. I just go and I walk through this code and ultimately I get Again, a single vector for a gesture. Um, as you can see here on this image, you can see this works really well. Very low latency, very rapidly. But the most amazing thing again is it learns really rapidly. You don't only you do one or two times the gesture, and you actually get fairly good accuracy going forward. So we actually now have built this with the whole system. This is not on this particular demo where we indeed can do a whole slew of gestures, counting with your fingers and so on and so forth, and classifying them. So you can really start thinking about sign language. You can think about prosthetic devices that basically are artificial arms driven by this approach. Now, H, the EMG problem is actually a fairly relatively easy problem because the signals you're getting from your electrode on your arm are actually pretty good. It's a lot harder when you basically start talking about um, uh, think like EEG recognition. I want to do a brain-machine interface where I put a bunch of electrodes on my head and I measure the signals in my head. Basically, what basically emerges from the EEG and I try to figure out what the intent is, what the motor function is you want to do, like drive a wheelchair or drive a computer on the screen and so on and so forth. So, the challenge that a lot of the people face that have been working with this before is that they notice that every single person is different. Sometimes you want to have uh, in terms of, you look at the data, what are the windows I'm going to use in terms of the data representation. If I go to the frequency domain, what is the size of the bins that I should use to quantify the data and so on and so forth. So what we did is actually say, okay, we're not going to worry about it. We're going to just put them all in there. We basically overdimension the number of inputs, feed them into our encoder, and lo and behold, we got really excellent results out of this. So it shows that it basically is some of behaving like some of our sensory systems that are happening in the human body. I'm not saying they're basically equivalent, but it is definitely an inspiration. So, what I described so far was classification. 
But as I said, the important thing is reasoning, reasoning by analogy and so on and so forth. So if you as a human see this question, what is the dollar of Mexico? You know exactly what the answer is, right? Even though the question itself doesn't make any sense. But it's basically some analogy. So with HD processing, it's actually trivial to do this. Because suppose now I create a data field. I say, okay, I have data field one. I have key value pairs, country, USA, two ten thousand bit vector. I multiply them together. I have a key value pair. Money unit, dollar, population, so many. I combine this all together and add them. I now have a vector, which is the USA. Same thing for Mexico. I have those things stored. I have trained them. I learned them. Now, basically, I can start ask question is, uh, what is, uh, if I multiply R2, the field is said, what country is this about? You multiply this with country, you get Mexico out. Or if I do R1 times dollar times R2, multiplication, I get peso out. So you can start actually doing combinations of things. You start applying reasoning on those fields by just mathematical operators. This is more interesting even. I have an image. I have an image uh, with a bunch of objects. Let's say the standard problem is you have a set of characters, one, two, three numbers. Now, we know that deep nets are really good in discovering those numbers and classifying them. I say, okay, there's a one, two, seven. So actually, I will use that. Uh, if, why not pick something that works really well? But what I cannot do with my deep network is asking questions about those images. It says, what is below a two and to the left of a one? That's kind of the type of questions I would like to ask about my images while I'm basically interpreting them. So a query system, basically. Again, this is straightforward in a HG representation. And I show it right here. This is a picture, for instance, and I basically found the objects. I have a man, a woman, and a dog. And now also I have spatial information. Where's the man, where's the woman, and so on and so forth. I combine them together. So I combine the information about the object with the location of that object as a spatial type of field. I combine them all together, and now I have a representation of the scene, which is called S. And now I can ask questions like, where is the man? I multiply man inverse by the scene, and I get the spatial information of where the man is. Or what is in the middle? So you start asking questions like this. Again, we can start thinking about reasoning, all through basic, the basic arithmetic. OK? So last part, last five minutes or so, well, I'm going to talk about why this is good from an implementation perspective. Well. The good news about this is already what I said. The key thing about HGC, it's a tight interweaving of memory and logic. It's true in memory computation. Again, with our new 3D technology, we can put SRAMs, non-volatile memories, and stack them on logic devices very nice and closely. It is approximate, which means that I don't have to worry too much about yield factors. If something breaks down, that's OK. If I have low SNR, that's OK. It's a, I can make lots of errors and still do fine, just like my brain does. And it's scalable. So there's some interesting elements that we're playing around with to basically do exactly this. And by the way, I just before I go any further, I just want to show the argument that a de graceful degradation, that we actually can survive with very high levels of failures, uh, that that's true, is an example again here. Where this is for the language example I showed you. And we start randomly flipping bits around in a machine, randomly and we keep on increasing the number of errors we're making. Typical algorithms are going to crash violently after a certain amount of errors are basically brought in. Not HGC, you get a graceful degradation, as you would expect. Obviously, if 50% of the bits is wrong, you don't know anymore what you're talking about. So how would an HG processor look like? Well, this is the general process you can imagine. You have things that help you to generate seed vectors, these random numbers, templates which could be done through ROM, or you can generate them on the fly using random number generators. Then you feed them to your encoders, which are these local and or uh, majority gate type of operation and local shift. And then finally, you have your associative memory. And you can have banks of processing elements like that all together. So I call it an HLU, uh, like an ALU, but a high dimensional logic operator or unit, which really is a programmable unit that does ma multiply majority or basically does 
permute multiply type functions. Just like a multiply accumulator, but remember they're working on one bit. They just look at one bit in the vector. There's no carries or anything like that. No global signals, no something that basically impacts. And then you have the associative memory, which is the most important part, how to build that. Typical way would be in a digital world, you basically have a digital memory, you read out the word, you compute the distance between your inter input work, you do this all over the world, and you say, okay, that's the best match. Really expensive. It's a lot cheaper if I actually can do the search inside the memory. And if I can do it in analog. I say I have 10,000 bits, and every bit basically that's different injects a little current on the match line, and I look at the slope of that match line, and I know how close it is. And I basically do a quick scan over all those words, I can actually come out quickly with a resolution of this. So there's really interesting approaches that can be enabled by combining analog logic into your memory cells. And actually some of those new technologies that are emerging enable us to do this exactly that. This is work that's done by one of my colleagues in Berkeley, Saif Salhoun, who's working on ferroelectric type of transistors, or negative capacitance transistors, as I call them, where the gate material partially is a ferroelectric device. This device, by nature, has hysteresis behavior because of the, of the, of the ferroelectric uh, field that basically is present. So it is a memory element. It's a non-volatile memory map. And actually, I can turn, create a cam cell with only two transistors and a match line, which basically does my analog processing. So this whole distance computation, two transistors per bit, match line, and in the end, obviously, something analog that measures the slope and does the search over these different elements. And again, this whole thing can be done very nicely by stacking those devices on top of the traditional process. This is a back end of line process, it's low temperature. Um, we can generate random numbers very nicely because those devices are lousy. They are all over the map. So if you make increase in amount of lousiness and you do it on purpose, I can create very beautiful random number generators. Um, and this is some work we did together with Stanford Philip Wong and Supajis Mitra, where we actually built random number generators that are actually perfectly almost uh, uh, white noise generated. So that's very cool as well. Very high uh, sigma to mu ratio. And then we can start saying, okay, now can we try to combine that logic by encoding together with the memory structures? And again, this is an effort with that together with uh, the Stanford folks. It uh, was published last year in, uh, Vilesi, in the Symposium of Vilesi Technology, where you can see a vertical memory. Every pillar is a memory cell. The gates are basically, this is an RM memory cell, by the way. And the logic is done by the combination of these vertical stacks. Um, we actually can do our OR, or XOR operation. We can do our majority gate operation. We can do our, um, our permute operation all into the memory element. That is shown right here. This is a kind of symbolic representation of this. You can see your memory stack. We have multiple bits stacked up on top of each other, just like you have in a, the modern day flash memories. And now by the way you connect them together and the way you excite the circuit, I can do multiplication, addition, permutation. And it's all basically pretty much analog. It's not a discrete value it's, or anything like that. You get a certain set of voltage levels, which is good enough for the computation we're talking about. So, where does this lead? Well, I, I'm kind of happy to give you a preview. This is the first 3D HD processor. It's not published yet. It will be published in ISSC 2018, in a couple of months from now. And it basically is a complete, basically implements our language recognition problem by indeed combining the random number generation, the encoding, as well as the associative memory, all in a single integrated entity. That's probably the most complex uh, device integrated uh, carbon nanotube plus RM device that's ever been published so far. So with that, I just want to look back and basically give you some of the highlights of what I wanted to bring to you. I, number one, I believe that learning-based approaches and brain-inspired approaches will become a very interesting alternative to traditional computing. They won't replace everything, but anything which is perceptive-based everything which is cognitive-based, actually I think these approaches have a great opportunity there to deliver devices that are smaller and more energy efficient. Um, there are challenges, obviously, as how do you scale in size, energy efficiency, and so on and so forth. So interesting questions to be asked, uh, but the opportunities are there. 
I think we have a number of technologies out there we can start playing around with, and we have to think out of the box. Those devices won't deliver computers and processes as they did in the past. But in the end, again, what I'm dreaming of is this end-to-end -end autonomous cognitive engines. These engines that I can carry with me, take data from all of my body around the world, and give me guidance on the spot of what to do and actually perform actuation. And with that, I would like to open the floor for questions. Thank you. Yes. Okay, you might pass the microphone. Uh, That's probably easier. <coughs> because it's hard to get out. <laughs> Thank you. I, I really enjoy. I was wondering about the, you, you mentioned about the vector size. What, what's mm -hmm. the, um, what's the size? How do we determine? Is the large is always better? And right. then how large can we go? Is it a, like a plot that's, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually, it's something that is fairly easily analyzable. It's kind of almost like information theory. It's about capacity. How much information can I jam into a single vector before they start basically polluting each other? We've done experiments with all kinds of sizes. What we observed, and you say go to factor 10, uh, to factor 1,000 vector length, we see fairly sizable degradation. You can go to 5,000 without too much of a hassle. But you go below that, we start seeing that, actually you start seeing encroachment. You don't get these nice clustering anymore, you start seeing overlap in the clusters. And again, this is pure information theoretic. It says you have a space, how much information can I basically store in that space before you start polluting it? The same thing if I take a single vector and I start encoding time, and I keep on doing this, how much information can I jam into a single vector and then still enroll it that I can basically go back into time? You will see that you can do this nicely, but after a certain time, you start seeing that the data starts being muddier and muddier and muddier and basically starts degrade. So again, that's things you can actually predict from pure information theory. Hi, uh, what are the speed and power ratios compared to uh, the natural world? So uh, that's a good question. Uh, what are we after here? My goal, is indeed energy efficiency. That's really what I'm driving at. Those machines don't have to drive, run very fast. They're not multiplex per se. We do some multiplexing, but we try to minimize that. So it's purely parallel. So the performance of the devices can be very low. And we do this on purpose. Ultimately, I would like to run those things. My goal is to see if I can push this below 100 millivolt operation. And then my speed will be very, 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 very slow. Um, so the performance really comes from the parallelism. And the goal really is energy efficiency. Can I indeed break that bottleneck that basically says right now, you cannot go below a certain voltage because of the fact that you lose your determinist. We basically can get way below that, I believe. So kind of comparing, we're trying to, I'll, we should, we were actually doing a tape out in silicon as well. You, you see the one that basically uses our SRAM and RM and things like that. Um, we're doing tape out in silicon as well. It would be an interesting, combination, com comparison between the two, speed area type of trade-offs, speed uh, performance trade-offs, uh, energy trade-offs, and see basically, let's say you take a traditional implementation of an algorithm, you take this, how they basically fit in that overall space. But we're not after performance. Performance is really true concurrency. Yes? Qu question. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, uh, I have uh, two sides of the question. The first thing is, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, the, uh, the neural network basically is uh, a bunch of uh, you know, multipliers. So do they have to be a floating point or uh, integer would do? Uh, mm -hmm. That's one thing. Yeah. Uh, the second question is, uh, uh, can we uh, use uh, the traditional thinking called the instruction set architecture to look at this, this whole thing and see if we, uh, we can use uh, instruction set architecture to represent mm -hmm. uh, what we really want to build, mm -hmm. uh, however, at the same time, we'll mimic our brains, if uh, there is some, some such thing called the brain. Yeah. So uh, two questions. The first one is, is a precision issue. I think I tried to point it out in the slide I showed you about the uh, various implementation of, of, of deep nets or neural nets. Um, if you look at the TPU, one of the key things that the TPU is saying, well, we don't need 32 bits, we don't need floating point for the multiplier accumulates. We can get around with 8 bits, 
There's some beautiful work that was done at Stanford and together with NVIDIA actually and trying to figure out how, how much, how low can you go? Can you use four bits? There's people that believe today that you actually can go as low as one bit uh, accuracy. So where that straight off sits is a very interesting one. Also, how many weights do you need per layer? If a weight is getting very small, do you, why not make it zero? Use sparsity. Uh, basically eliminate some of those values. So that's a whole interesting trade-off. But I believe uh, absolutely, I think I'm convinced that you can get away with very low precisions if you have many weights. It's a trade-off between the parallelism in the representation and the accuracy of each weight, basically, that you're playing around with. So yeah, low precision is the way to go. The second question was, um, I tried to recall the second question. Uh, instruction set. So in reality here, I have a machine that has an instruction set, right? I have three operations, and I have, uh, so I can actually build this as an instruction set processor. Now, is that the instruction set of the brain? By no means. The brain doesn't have an instruction set per se, right? There's no such thing as an instruction set as far as I know. Uh, again, it's all about patterns. Ultimately, a brain, a part of the brain will fire when the set of excitation is such that you basically get over a certain threshold. If you get close enough, suddenly you start seeing something this, um, and you see that a set of neurons together suddenly will fire and the next way it will fire and so on and so forth. Uh, the perfect example for it is the, the example of the Mona Lisa neuron. You might have heard about this. So the question is, do, is there a neuron in our brain that when we see the Mona Lisa painting, that it fires like, goes crazy and say, that's the Mona Lisa, that's the Mona Lisa. Um, the answer is actually is somewhere in between. Uh, there is no such thing. But there's obviously neurons that are going to fire more extensively when they see the Mona Lisa. But if I take that single neuron and I zap it, you will still recognize the Mona Lisa. Because it's, by analogy, you have a network of neurons that together basically decide what happens. And those, ne those things can be used for various other reasons as well. There's some overlay and overlap. So I don't think there's an instruction set per se. In my HLU, though, however, I can come up with an instruction set. But I don't want to have that because it makes it very, very, um, again, finite state machines are very prone to errors. When an error happens in finite state machine, I'm toast. So I'm trying to avoid that. Yes. And uh, I, I have a question here. So uh, you mentioned the example of the high dimensional vector uh, with, with 10,000 uh, dimensions, right? So is the 10,000 is just an example or is, that, or is this number from your experiment? So why not 50,000 or even more? That's a good question. Should I go to higher? It again, it, it, I believe that, again, it's about how much information do I try to represent. I think, indeed, if you would try to build a big general purpose engine, you actually might want to go to different, to higher dimensions. But I don't think it's the right solution. Again, as the brain basically has specific regions for specific functions, trying to put all those functions into one engine is not a good idea. You build an en engine that does the basic pre basically does vision. You have a one that more basically is involved with auditory type system. So you actually can get away with smaller dimensions if you keep the numbers of vectors that you or classes you're trying to deal with smaller. Yeah. I think that's probably the right answer. But you can trade off for sure. Yeah, I mean, follow on. Uh, my my thought was um, when you're looking at efficient uh, computing, why only computing? The, the issue is, why, why aren't you looking at the entire uh, equation of uh, um, acquisition and action? You do, right, absolutely. Now, this is my ultimate goal, but do you think again, if I look at how I do processing in the brain, and I think that little movie showed it to you, there are certain things, dedicated functions that first say, okay, I have an auditory system coming in, I'm gonna process it, I'm gonna divide it into words, and I'm gonna start making sense of those words. That's your auditory cortex component. Then it goes to the prefrontal cortex, basically, and some other regions that basically do construction and decision making. Decision making of what, what I'm gonna answer, right? That's the decision part. But ultimately, it has to go back to motor control because everything I say, I basically control my mouth, I use my tongue, my vocal tract. That's that basically a motor control thing. So you have a set of functions and they go in sequence. One, once one's basically fired enough, they have enough inputs to the next one, the next one fires. So partitioning is really important. Hi. Um, how do you decide what the kind of optimal semantic encoding is? I mean, are you just generating these codes from text features? And, you know, the brain probably has some mm -hmm. mechanism for 
you know, figuring out what high dimensional vector it wants to use, and that's yep. probably not just bigrams and trigrams. So, yep. Yep. how do you how do you generate those representations? Very good question. Uh, how do you do so? We have done a lot of stuff through experimentation initially, and so okay, what works? Um, and um, and then you see, for instance, that for certain things like uh, gestures and things like that, you see one person, you do a test on one person, you take another person, you see a different result. Uh, so it actually is depending upon the test subject you're dealing with. So there's no uniform encoding. So there are a couple of approaches you can do and uh, that uh, I think about. Number one is you do, again, you do use redundancy. So I'm going to basically, I'm not going to try to make a decision on exactly what representation, I'm going to feed a number more channels. I increase the number of channels going in. That's one, but it's expensive. That's not, the brain does it partially. Again, we have over-representations. Over uh, but the other one is obviously feedback. If I basically start learning something and I basically have an encoding, uh, and my AB, I might have many more channels, at the end you basically start seeing the outcome, you can use the outcome to feedback and basically fine tune the, uh, what features really make sense. So adaptive basically changes of what features, how to combine them, you use trigrams, quadrigrams, quintograms or whatever it is, basically using feedback is a very interesting approach to take. We have played around a little bit with that, but are just at the starter. But uh, yeah, it's an excellent question and I something we have been playing around with a lot. We only have time for the last question. So do we have? Uh, okay, so just last question on that side. Maybe you could just follow up. So we have the peripheral line. neural system with that central sorry, neural system like right here. Sorry, we have like 300 people, <laughs> so it's kind of hard to manage. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, well, thank you, but I'm like the first person who is not in the central area. So two quick questions. You're saying these things are brain-inspired. Mm -hmm. Do you, do neuro neuroscientists have any evidence that uh, recognizing Mona Lisa or a scene with a man and a woman and a dog involves anything like, information processing-wise, your high-dimensional algebra? Mm -hmm. Related to that, when I look at German, French, and English, I only understand English in detail, a little bit of French and German. Mm -hmm. I can tell right away which one is which. Yeah. Does that recognition happen by the kind of statistical uh, model, essentially mm -hmm. statistical model, just at the level of letters or, mm -hmm. uh, that you claim? I'm not convinced that that's the case of what happens in the grades, but I, I don't know, so I'm asking. Yeah. Thanks. So that's, again, two questions. The first question is, uh, do we have any evidence that, uh, that some of these approaches are what happen in the brain? Actually, the, moral, the Mona Lisa neuron thing is something that has been studied for a long period of time. And I think people have been converging and, and they've been ultimately coming to the, I think there's, a, you talk to a lot of the computational neuroscientists, the key thing is not the individual element, in the, it's basically the pattern, the set of the connectivity of a set of neurons that really matters if something gets recognized. So the idea of this kind of a, a collection of neurons basically representing information, not a single neuron, is something that is accepted by a group on, of uh, neuroscientists. Now, at the same time, are we claiming that this is what happens in the brain, that this kind of hyperdimensional stuff is, it's, it's, we got a set of ideas. Uh, we basically figure out did I work or not. I'm not gonna make any claims. It, it's, it's inspired. This is why I use the word inspired. It is something you look at basically, is try to interpret what might be going on and say, does that work? Can I basically build something on top of that? And then potentially later you can go back and say, is it really what happens? The second question was... Uh, I'm, I'm, so, so, like yeah. Right? yeah. Right. Okay. So I show, I, there's another slide I have that I didn't show because now I basically train my languages, right? Now what I can start doing is I have multiple languages in my hyperdimensional space. I have a, a vector for every language. I can start computing distances between those different languages. How close are they to each other? Some of them are gonna be closer than other ones. And you indeed see these clusters emerge. You see French, Italian, Spanish basically get together. English, German, you see the uh, Scandinavian languages in one corner. You start seeing that clustering happening purely statistically. Some things are closer than other ones and you see that definitely emerge in the representations. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we don't have uh, any more time for the questions. You could uh, follow up with the speaker offline. We're sorry, we, we understand that there are so many other questions remaining. Let's thank Professor Rabai one more time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, think I can, yeah. Thank you very much.